I hope you're having a great day and a blessed day. Today in ancient church history, we take a fourth look at the life of John Chrysostom, the golden mouth preacher of Constantinople. Last time we looked at the newly minted preacher who began to have an immediate impact upon the congregation in the cathedral in Antioch. Today we turn to Chrysostom as a preacher, as he begins to mature, and we're going to talk about a series of sermons that established his reputation. These were the homilies of the statues, and we'll talk about the dramatic context in which he preached them. Now the church in Antioch appreciated good oratory. The same time Christosim told the congregation, the church is not a theater that we should listen for amusement. With profit ought we to depart hence, and some fresh and great gain should we acquire before we leave. When he wrote a book on the priesthood, a book on pastoral ministry, he also talked about how ministers were to preach. It was very important to him that ministers preach in such a way that they seize the attention of the congregation. That's what all good orators recognize, that preaching is an oral act of communication. We could say, in some sense, preaching is, first of all, communication, secondly, communication, thirdly, communication, just like we talk about how when it comes to real estate, location, location, location. Now, this is something that Christosim said. He said, or do you not know what a passion for oratory has nowadays infatuated Christians? So he's saying, don't you recognize that Christians want to hear well-communicated sermons? He says, do you not know that its exponents are respected above everyone else not just by outsiders, but by those of the household of the faith. So he's saying Christians and unbelievers value good communication. So he says, how then can anyone endure the deep disgrace of having his sermon received in blank silence and feelings of boredom as listeners wait for the end of the sermon as if it were a relief from fatigue, or as they listen to someone else's sermon, however long, with eagerness and are annoyed when he is about to finish and quite exasperated when he decides to say no more. Now, that's something that preachers and seminary students need to take seriously today as well. We once again live in an oral society, it seems. People are watching videos or watching TV more than they are reading books or reading other literature. Many people hardly read. They only learn by listening to audio, to the radio, or to podcasts, or by watching videos. And so what Christostom is saying is saying, don't bore the congregation. That's why I think for some ministers, if it comes to this, just throw away your paper. If you can only get there behind the pulpit and for 20 minutes speak about what you have learned this past week, what your research has led you to appreciate, what what has found its way into your heart. And if you can speak about that in a moving way that seizes the interest of the congregation for 20 minutes, that's way better than reading a sermon in a boring way for 35 or 45 minutes. Christostom mostly preached for an hour. His approach was exegetical. He preached through books of the Bible. As he would work his way through the text. He would often just have a sermon that was like a running commentary. That was a weakness of his sermons. Calvin would pick up on that later. Instead of having a message that had a main point, sort of a well-rounded, unified message, he would just simply follow the order of the text. What he would do is he would first work his way through the text, and then he would often conclude with a more prophetic application of the text. So his sermons didn't have such good organization. Now, from the very beginning, John's preaching had a marked impact on his hearers. He possessed powers of expression unlike any of the other preachers in town. His reputation was established even more when he preached a series of sermons during a time of great trouble in the city of Antioch. This brings us to the matter of the homilies on the statues, or the sermons on the statues. Now, what was that all about? 
Well, his reputation as a preacher went out, especially after these sermons were heard and then also published as well. He preached these sermons in the context of a brief tax revolt that even involved throwing down statues of the emperor. And that's why these were called the homilies of the statues. Now, the emperor at that time was known for his fits of temper. And very quickly, what happened is that the saints in Antioch sent their bishop, Flavian, to Constantinople to intercede with the emperor, given what had happened. And in this context, John stepped into the pulpit, into the amble, to provide comfort and encouragement to a terrified population. The homilies of the statues are a series of sermons that he preached as the people in Antioch were terrified of what would happen because of a tax revolt. What had happened is that news had reached Antioch that the emperor had raised taxes, and not just a little bit. And in the courthouse of Antioch, this new government decree was read out. Apparently, the emperor was requiring an exorbitant task that applied to both the rich and and the poor. And some of the prominent citizens, in a very appropriate way, I think, tried to address the governor, and they pleaded for mercy. Some of the town councilors here, on behalf of the citizens, tearfully and respectfully beseeched the governor for mercy in this matter. But when the governor couldn't and didn't listen to them, a mob turned to violence. And so, on a morning, a mob suddenly attacked the residence of the governor, And then they damaged some of the public baths, which were often built at public expense. Then the mob turned on paintings and bronze statues of the emperor and his family. Now, the emperor was Theodosius, and this man had a terrible temper. Now, that would be evident three years later when he would become infamous by directing his soldiers to slaughter thousands of citizens in Thessalonica after an uprising. Then in the western part of the empire, Bishop Ambrose would take this emperor to task for that vicious and unchristian act. Now it's three years before that, but people know about the reputation of this emperor, how he has a temper, and therefore the citizens of Antioch were in a dangerous position. On top of that, the mob had burned down the house of a citizen who had defended the taxation. The authorities, realizing the gravity of what was happening here, sent some archers who, with their bows and arrows, were able to stop the riot. It would be sort of like a governor today calling up the National Guard to stop a riot. And so the riot was quickly put down. It had lasted only one morning and it was over. By noon, things had settled down. But this was a grave situation. The government, the local government, immediately sent messengers off to the emperor with the news what had happened. And the people knew that the act of destroying statues was something that would be viewed as an act of treason. An act against a statue of the emperor was tantamount to an act against the emperor's own person. The local government authorities immediately took steps to act to show that they were on the emperor's side uh, with respect to this incident. So they had people arrested. They executed some people immediately. Others, many people, began to flee from the city in fear for their lives because somehow they had connections to someone, maybe to a city councilman or to some of these rioters. And Bishop Flavian, even though an old, old man was right away sent off to Constantinople to plead for mercy. When the emperor learned of this, he sent a general and a man named Caesarius to judge the situation. And when they arrived in town, they put together a commission, and the first thing the commissioners did was arrest all of the city councilors. They held the city fathers responsible for what had happened, even though they hadn't been part of the rioting. It was the official position that if the city councilors had not publicly expressed their unhappiness with the taxes and hadn't appealed for mercy, then the mob would have never done what they did. So the commission announced that Some of the city councilors would be executed. Others would be sent into exile. And they also announced other judgments, like Antioch would learn, would lose the honor of being considered a metropolis. They also canceled all entertainment in the city, like theaters are closed, the hippodrome is closed, no horse races. That was the type of punishment that emperors would often do. 
Also, they closed down the public baths. No one could, could take a nice bath. A poetic judgment because the rioters had destroyed some of the public baths that were built and maintained out of the public treasury. And the commission also announced that certain of the city councilors would, would face death and banishment. However, what happened is that these commissioners were, were beseeched that they would delay some of these punishments until the emperor could be approached for clemency, and they agreed with that. Now, it's in that fearful context that Christostom, as a new minister, preaches to a packed cathedral in Antioch. It's very interesting that John had been preaching through the book of Genesis, and he continued to do so. He didn't allow the situation to change that. But now the Hippodrome was closed, the theaters were closed, the businesses were closed, and vast crowds fearfully thronged into the Golden Church. And in his sermons, Christostom described how the streets in Antioch were empty. It reminds you what happened during COVID-19. He talks about how the businesses are closed, the streets are silent, the places of entertainment are quiet. It's very interesting that he says that Christians shouldn't become overcome with fear like non-believers. And I think that's an important point. In times of tragedy or war, Christians indeed should set an example of courage and trust in God. He thought that Christians ought to model their faith and dependence upon God in a time like this. In one sermon, he also emphasized what had happened when the commission had carried out judgment in town, and he used it to talk about the gravity of Judgment Day. He painted a, a very emotional portrait of the situation which relatives and friends of the city councilors waited outside while soldiers guarded the proceedings. People outside could hear the screams of witnesses who were being tortured, as was the custom in those days, in order for the government to get some witness statements from them. So that event was very fresh in the mind of the congregation. And then John talks about the judgment seat of Christ. He says, If here on earth men are judges, neither mother, sister, father, or any other person, though guiltless of the deeds per perpetrated, and can do nothing to rescue the criminals, he's talking about the helplessness of the people there, he says, Who will stand by us when we are judged at the dread tribunal of Christ? So he's making the point that if family members and friends standing there could do nothing to help their loved ones who were being indicted for treason on Judgment Day too, none of our friends will be able to stand with us if God condemns us. Bishop Flavin finally returned to the city with news, good news, that the emperor had given a pardon to the city councilors. He also restored the privileges that had been revoked for the city. So you can only imagine the relief of the Christians in Antioch. Now what stands out in these homilies of the statutes are a number of things. First, we find John exegeting scripture. Second, we find him applying the scripture in a way that comforts and encourages and challenges the people of God in a difficult time. Third, he preached them in such an explosive context. We actually learn much about this whole incident of the tax rebellion from his sermons. Another reason why these homilies have stood the test of time is that they were preached in Greek that was of classical quality. Now, it's true that he quoted from the Greek New Testament Bible and the Septuagint, of course, which were not written in Attic Greek, they were written in Koine Greek, that is, Common Greek. Yet he proclaimed the message of the gospel and communicated in Attic quality Greek. And it was this series of sermons that established Christostom's reputation as a preacher. His fame spread beyond Antioch. And in fact, how he had conducted himself in the midst of this very tense situation was something that would reach the ears of the emperor through some of his highest commissioners, especially one of his palace eunuchs. We have at least 700 sermons that have come down to us from Christostom. There are some more that have been fraudulently claimed to be sermons of his, and it isn't surprising if we might hear some new reports about 
some unknown sermons until now being discovered in monasteries and manuscripts. But we have 700 sermons that have come down to us from Christosom, so that's a large number of sermons. We should be very thankful for the transcribers in the church in Antioch, and then later in Constantinople, who wrote down his messages word for word as much as they could. Included in this, we have 75 sermons on the book of Genesis. We also have 144 sermons on the book of Psalms. We have 90 sermons on the book of Matthew, and then 88 on the Gospel of John. We have 244 on Paul's epistles. And then we have 54 sermons on the book of Acts, which together constitute really the first commentary on the book of Acts in the history of Christianity. There are a few of Christosom's sermons that were not evidented by, uh, edited by the preacher, evidently. They were defective and probably are uncorrected copies of stenographers who never provided a copy to the preacher to edit. What is clear is that Christosom's sermons are not literary documents. These are not fancy documents that are written in his study ahead of time, as would be the case by too many Anglican preachers in the 17th and 18th centuries who wrote very flowery, flowery, flowery sermons in their studies. No, the origin of these sermons is in the pulpit. He simply edited the transcripts of his extemporaneous sermons for publication. And everywhere, his sermons are filled with passages that make clear that we have a record of the act of preaching. For example, he will talk to the congregation about what he preached about the day before. Sometimes he describes how some of his parishioners are pushing and shoving to find a better place in the church to hear his voice preaching. And so these are records of actual sermons. Now his sermons are not as organized as one could hope, and John Calvin imitated his approach, which involves simply working through the various verses in the chapter. And the result is that you don't have a standalone message. You don't have a unified message that makes one great big point. You can't find the big idea, for example. And so that was a weakness. And this approach easily leads to a majoring in the minors. But Calvin was impressed by Christostom's exegesis and by the fact that he used a literal, historical, grammatical approach to interpretation. And so Calvin would be involved in publishing an edition of Christostom sermons. In a preface to this work, Calvin wrote about how Christostom outdid many other church fathers with his historical and grammatical interpretation of the text. Now, it is hard for us so many centuries later to get a sense of the impact of Christostom's preaching, whether in a large church in Antioch or later on in the cathedral of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. We can scarcely comprehend what it was like for him to be in a context where there were thousands of people listening to him and responding with rapturous applause. It's one thing, you know, to read the sermons of a great orator. It's a wholly different experience to actually hear the sermons preached. Like, think of George Whitfield. George Whitfield had a powerful voice. And had a powerful effect upon his hearers. In fact, he could so easily move his congregations to tears. But when you actually read a transcript of one of Whitfield's sermons, you don't even get close to the experience of what it was like to actually hear Whitfield's voice. In the church in Antioch, people would try to get close to the pulpit because John Christosom didn't have such a powerful voice. He didn't have a voice like a trumpet. One biographer has described, though, what it was like to hear Christostom preach. This is what the biographer says. He says, as he, that is Christostom, advanced from exposition to practical appeals, his delivery became gradually more rapid, his countenance more animated, his voice more vivid and intense. The people began to hold in their breath. The joints of the loins were loosened. A creeping sensation like that produced by a series of electric waves pass over them. They felt as if drawn toward the pulpit by a sort of magnetic influence. 
Some of those who were sitting rose from their seats. Others were overcome with a kind of faintness as if the preacher's mental forces were sucking the life out of their bodies. And by the time the discourse came to an end, the great mass of that spellbound audience could only hold their heads and give vent to their emotions in tears. Now that is a remarkable response to his preaching. As Christostom engaged in extemporaneous preaching, preaching from the heart, preaching with power, he had a massive impact upon the congregation. It's the same with me when I've listened to preachers who are very powerful and use an extemporaneous approach, you don't get bored. Their excitement and their passion is something that draws you into the sermon. Now it's true that uh, Christostom's pulpit was a place where he did push his ascetic theology. On the other hand, he was very prophetic and sharp in his attack on those who abuse riches or power. He also took on those who engaged in worldly entertainments. He was, a, he was a very prophetic, fearless preacher, and he preached many things that his congregations needed to hear. They were very worldly, just like today in the church. There's far too much worldliness. Later on, he would get in trouble for preaching against the impress. He didn't always have enough tact in the pulpit. At the end of his career, when the Empress was trying to exile him from Constantinople, he began a sermon on John the Baptist's martyrdom with the explosive words, Again Herodias raves, again she rages, again she dances, again she asks for the head of John upon the charger. Can you imagine how explosive that must have been? He's playing off the fact that he had the same name as John the Baptist and that the Empress was now coming for his head, and she was. But he had a lot of courage, and when he preached a sermon right before his second exile, he communicated his Christian courage. He is now going to be sent in exile away from the church. He said, the waters are raging and the winds are blowing, but I have no fear, for I stand firmly upon a rock. What am I to fear? Is it death? Life to me means Christ, and death is gain. Is it exile? The earth and everything that holds belongs to the Lord. Is it loss of property? I brought nothing into this world. I will bring nothing out of it. I have only contempt for the world and its ways. Now, that didn't mean that Christosom didn't suffer during his exile. He certainly did. But you can see how he is a man of courage, and he has his priorities right. Theologically, there were some good things about his preaching. For example, he did not teach the medieval idea that the Lord's Supper was a mass or a repeated non-bloody sacrifice. In fact, in his sermon on Hebrews 10 verse 9, he says, We do not offer another sacrifice, but we make a commemoration of the sacrifice. Yeah, that's very appropriate that he would say that there because the writer to the Hebrews is emphasizing that Jesus Christ has once and forever sacrificed himself for his people. He preached against wealth and things that violated his ascetic tendencies. He preached, for example, against elaborate and expensive weddings. Now, there was probably room for that since people were trying to show off their wealth and wasting their wealth. He preached against the abuse of power and the waste of money, which is something that we Americans can be too afraid to do. He preached against drunkenness and preached against gluttony. And here we live in a country where, of course, there's way too much abuse of alcohol. And also, we think gluttony is not a sin. He also preached against abortion. As a man of his time, unfortunately, he didn't preach against the institution of slavery per se, although he did preach against the abuses of slavery. Thankfully, he also said that if everyone loved their neighbor, there would be no enslavement. But he took his congregation to task. He would be prophetic. He told them that it was wrong for them to avoid attending church in the summertime. They claimed it was too hot. He put these words and excuses into their mouths. You, he said, you say, the heat is excessive. 
The scorching sun is intolerable. We cannot bear to be crushed in the crowd and be oppressed by the heat and confined space. In other words, the people in Antioch didn't want to go to church because there was no air conditioning. And then there were other people who would rather go to the chariot races than to church. And so our preacher took them to task. As a preacher, John Christostom had theological strengths. They included, for example, his teaching on the doctrine of the Trinity. He was a great defender of Nicene Trinitarian theology. He did have some weaknesses as well, though, in his theology. First, his ascetic theology hampered him and gave him a wrong view of marriage and the good things that God gives to his people. Second, also very seriously, he held to a semi-Pelagian approach to the doctrine of salvation. In the early church, unfortunately, there was a relationship developing between asceticism and semi-Pelagianism. You know, according to asceticism, somehow one can, in some sense, marry with God or something like that through self-denial. Other scholars have pointed out that one reason why Christostom and other, other early theologians were weak on the doctrines of grace was due to an over-response to Stoic fatalism that undermine human responsibility. So, in over-response to this kind of thing, Christostom would emphasize free will in a way that the semi-Pelagians would agree with and appreciate. He could even talk about how he thought that Jesus died for all people, even those who will never believe. And John's ascetic theology would result in conflict with the imperial family and with the rich and powerful in Constantinople. Because the problem, of course, wasn't that he simply viewed the, the abuse of riches as an evil, or the love of money as an evil, but it was almost as if the, the mere possession of money was in some sense a moral shortcoming. But his great strength as a preacher was the fact that he was an exegetical preacher. That was his great strength combined with his Attic quality Greek. And remember, when we read his sermons in English, there is no way we can appreciate what it was like to hear him actually preaching in the Greek language. So our preacher began a very powerful and influential ministry. The whole matter of the tax revolt and his homilies on the statues brought him to the attention of the powerful. And suddenly, against his will, or at least without his knowledge, suddenly he is plucked out of the city of Antioch, where he was carrying out such an effective ministry. And the emperor summons him to Constantinople, the new Rome, in order that he might become the bishop of the leading see in the eastern part of the church the Bishop of Constantinople. And next time, that's what we will look at. We will look at his journey to Constantinople, how he is secreted away, and then he takes up his place as a preacher in the Hagia Sophia Cathedral in the capital.